We'll wait just another minute for people to sign on and then we'll begin. Okay, we're going to get started. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Seattle MLK Organizing Coalition's 39th Annual MLK Celebration. Each year, we honor Dr. King's legacy with a rally, march, and community workshops amplifying our call for peace and economic and social justice. This year, we also honor the legacy of Congressman John Lewis and his call for good trouble, necessary trouble. This hour's workshop is disability justice in the context of Dr. King's legacy. The workshop will be a conversation between two disabled individuals, Christiana Obe Sumner, an autistic and multiply disabled black non-binary person who will provide perspective of how to move the Black Disabled Lives Matter community forward and disability justice sustainably, effectively, accessibly, and collectively. Elizabeth Ralston, a white accessibility consultant who is deaf and is the founder of the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Forum, a consortium, will discuss the work that is needed within white spaces for moving towards solidarity with disabled BIPOC individuals and discuss how accessibility is a key part of this conversation. Afterwards, there will be a facilitated question and answer session for further discussion. I'm Katie Harris. Together with Abiel Waldu, we'll be your moderators for this workshop. In just a minute, I'll introduce you to Christiana and Elizabeth. But first, I will explain our format. We will be using Zoom's webinar feature. You will be able to submit questions to the moderators at any time during the presentation using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Only the moderators and presenters will see your questions. After the presenters conclude their presentations, we will switch to Q&A. At the conclusion of the workshop, we'll ask you to fill out a brief evaluation. These evaluations are very important. They help us understand who attends and how to plan for future workshops. So now I'd like to introduce you to Christiana and Elizabeth. Take it away. Hello, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Ralston, and I'm an accessibility consultant working um, 
and the intersection of public health and accessibility. And I wanted to let you know that I am a white woman with short silver hair, wavy silver hair, wearing a blue shirt with little suns on, wrapped around in a light blue shawl and sitting on a brown sofa with a beige background behind me. And I wanted to let everybody know that there is captioning for this session. And you can turn the captioning on if you go down to the bottom of your screen, you will see live transcript. And if you press on that button and you will see subtitle. If you click on subtitle, then you will see the captions. Christiana. Hello everyone, I'm Christiana. I also like everyone to know if you um, are listening or reading as opposed to watching today, I am a black non-binary non person with a uh, black secretary glasses and red lipstick. I have a uh, coily hair that is pulled up in a bun. I'm wearing a t-shirt with a bunch of skulls on it and a, a, a black sweater. Uh, I am in a room that is full of books and I don't know how to explain it any more than that um, with a guitar and um, a, a purple curtain um, and there may or may not be a puppy that comes in and out that is black and white and has a houndstooth shirt on. Um, my pronouns are they them. I am a activist, an artist, and a, a consultant and founder of Epiphanies of Equity LLC, which is a, a social equity consulting firm specializing in anti-racism, disability justice, uh, LGBTQIA plus justice, um, anti-capitalism, and uh, other organ, uh, liberation uh, frameworks and organizing strategies. I am also founder of the Eleanor Elizabeth Institute for Black Empowerment and Liberation, which seeks to um, for, uh, further in, in research and build collective of, at the um, lived experience and intersection of Blackness and disability. Thank you for coming today. Thank you so much for being here. And, um, you know, I want to say, Christiana, I've heard the expression, um, a room without books is like a body without a soul. <laughs> um, and so I wish I had some books behind me because I really do have books in this room somewhere. Anyway, thank you all for being with us to discuss a very important and timely um, subject. And um, what we would like to do is put everything in the context of um, Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham. He, um, in 1965, I believe, um, he was in jail in Birmingham and he wrote this letter. And so um, I'll have Christiana um, quickly um, summarize that. And you can certainly find that online, but we would like to answer some questions that are relevant to this topic. Yeah, so when we, uh, Elizabeth was like, we should do this thing for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And I was like, you know what I really think we should do? We should read a letter to Birmingham jail. And I was like, the reason why is because as I've been thinking about what's been happening in 2020, which is like, the, has been like the master class of inequity, like everything that I feel like I went off and I told people about and trainings and things like that. Well, the last year has been pretty much if you need any sort of case studies or examples of what's happening like right now in our life, like that was it. So I was like, we should read this letter because it's one of the most quoted pieces by Martin Luther King Jr. But I don't know if people actually like, sat down and like read it. And if they read it, they probably read it once, like a long time ago, maybe in high school. And I don't know if people have actually have taken the time to see how much this document shows that after some 50 something years, that time is such a flat circle. And so we're doing that from the perspective of disability justice. And disability justice is a liberatory framework that um, essentially is saying, you know, that yes, there's the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA, but there's uh, so many more uh, gap areas, pain areas that really need to be addressed and it needs to be led by those who are most impacted, specifically those at the greatest intersections of marginalization, oppression, and exploitation. So I, um, I thought it would be, you know, I, so I'm excited to have this space where, um, uh, I can talk about this from the perspective of being a disabled black person, obviously. And Elizabeth can talk about this from the perspective of, of uh, you know, working towards uh, being in solidarity and being a white person. 
Exactly. You explained it um, so well. Um, uh, so one of the questions that we were asking was, um, what feels familiar in this letter? Um, how are some of the pain points MLK mentioned still happening today? Um, and I just want to make the point that what really resonated with me was um, his point about the right moderate um, and how, uh, quote, the right moderate is more devoted to order than justice. And that really resonated with me because it's saying that um, so many people, um, for so many people, it's easier to stay silent than to step forward and point out an injustice. And um, I, I fear that um, there's so many people thinking this way. And almost 60 years later, I still see the same thing, especially when it comes to accessibility. Um, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm the founder of the Seattle Cultural Accessibility Consortium. And we work on helping um, arts and cultural spaces improve accessibility for people of all abilities. And as a person who has a hearing loss, I used to, uh, two cochlear implants to hear. Um, I found that it was an inequitable way of welcoming and including people in the spaces. So from this perspective, um, if you don't step up and start talking about what um, those inequities are, then we can't really move the needle forward. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I am sorry, I have learned to mute because my spouse just walked in and the dog started barking and the whole house sort of flew up. So I apologize for that. Um, but yeah, so I mean, yes, I totally agree. And you know, the parts for me, I was thinking about this too, in terms of like, I had a twinge in my heart when Martin Luther King talked about the importance of tension and how, uh, so that we can like grow to begin discussion. And like, it was something like, he was saying that um, nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue um, and, I, and to open the door to negotiation. And I think, you know, as a consultant and activist, I'm constantly faced with this tension from some of my clients that they uh, want to lean into the uncomfortable and like actually do the work, but then they turn around in the same breath and say that they want to make sure that no one is uncomfortable in the process or in the trainings. And it's like, it's a, it's an uncomfortable situation. Like black and brown folks are eternally and existentially uncomfortable having to navigate this toxic anti-black ableist, classist, capitalist, fat phobic, queer phobic, transphobic as society. So to have empathy is to say, you have like some modicum of connection to the pain and the hardship someone else is experiencing and you're seeking to be in solidarity with them, like as like knee deep in the doldrums as they are. And in order for the work to move forward, leaning into the uncomfortable is not only a requirement, it's one of the bare minimums. Yes, and I'm uncomfortable. I will say that because <laughs> um, I realize <laughs> I realized that for so long, I have been leading with my white privilege. Um, you know, I grew up um, in a comfortable middle-class environment. I had parents who supported um, me when they found out about my disability. They did everything they could to make me, to, to help me succeed in this world that we live in. Um, and so um, I focused so much on just overcoming um, disability, overcoming access, overcoming so many uh, stigmas related to that, discrimination, you name it. Um, and then, you know, my work with the consortium has really um, blown open the doors of how um, we need to be thinking about all, not just all disabilities, but all people of all colors and nationalities. And I realized that um, I had my blinders on and I was leading from that white privilege. And um, even though I'm in a marginalized um, community as well, I wasn't thinking about the rest of that marginalized community. So this letter really resonated with me in that um, as part of the white moderate, I realized I need to step up and be more of an ally to BIPOC with disabilities, for example. And um, 
help elevate and amplify their voices. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there and there was um, there was a there was a passage in here too where uh, Martin Luther King was essentially saying that you know he was he was disappointed because. He, he was like, I, I thought that you know, he was writing this letter to to religious leaders, religious leaders who he thought was going to have his back doing this because that's where he's from. And um, they didn't have his back. They actually wrote a letter and said that all the things that he did were violent and didn't understand. And why couldn't he have waited? And didn't he just elected a new person and all these kinds of things? And it was like, it felt so much like that but he said something which is something that i've been feeling lately it's like well i thought that you would get it and i thought that you would see this i thought you would you know be be able to witness this but then it's like well sure like perhaps this must mean um why would why would i have expected someone to be able to see it when they don't have an embodied lived experience is essentially what you're saying like why would i have expected that um, and so, yeah, I mean, and I think that that's what's really difficult is that this is the, the, the part of it, I feel like it, part of it is holding the fact that, you know, we're doing the work and, and trying to, you know, trudge forward. But then it's also so frustrating because it's like, don't, don't you, don't you see what I see? Like, don't, did we, are we in the same space? Are we in the same reality? Because there's so much of that, that, um, you know, yeah. it, it becomes frustrating. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And you know, when he says, I don't understand why you are commending the police for the way they have handled the situation and they did not handle the situation very well. Yeah. Um, there was a long paragraph about all the abuse that the police um, inflicted upon black and brown folks, even people with disabilities. I mean, there's statistics out there that, um, you know, that show that um, one third to one half of people, of the, peop the people that please shoot are disabled folks and people of color. And that had not changed almost 60 years later. This is what we're seeing. So, um, so much of what he is saying is still true today. And so um, that leads me to feel a little pessimistic, you know, um, but at the same time, you know, I'm thinking, okay, where is the silver lining in all this? How can we continue to advocate in a way that, um, as he says, is nonviolent and um, is, um, is um, demonstrating that there is a path forward. So how do we keep doing that? As a white ally, I've been asked by people, how do I be a white ally? And I say, speak up, you know, um, go out there and make your voice heard. But it's just so much easier to stay home and be comfortable. But we need to start getting uncomfortable if we're gonna move forward, I think, as a country, if we're gonna have allies all across the board. Yes, and I think part of that too is, not falling into this uh, into a comfort simply because you, you know things are good for you but that doesn't mean that we didn't we didn't we didn't hit collective liberation and access yet which is two of the principles of disability justice there's no collective liberation none of us are free until all of us are free and there was this passage in there where he was talking about it because they had just had this election in alabama and they were like well why didn't you wait didn't you just elect this person and there was this passage in there that made me just think about some of the things I had to tell people all today, all the time, because there are people out there and it is, I mean, it's, it's, it's all people, it's my mama, but it's also I'm seeing disproportionately sort of like, you know, the white moderates, right? The people who, when it was Black Lives Matter last year, they were all, yeah, let's get down, let's, you know, let's get bad. And now like, oh, Biden won and the Senate is, is half democratic and the House is democratic, so it's cool, right? Like, no, not at all. Uh, and so, I mean, I'm sure he's a great person. I'm not saying that, but he's like, come on, he's like the epitome, like the living embodiment of the white moderate. Like, 
He just released today, I, I was reading an article where he says he's going to he's going to shoot for bipartisanship by making sure there's 10 Republicans in agreement. I'm like, why would you even do that? So I mean, I was going to read this, the passage I'm talking about, and, and I put a 2021 spin because it's like, this is what I heard in my head. It's um on the it's on the first what is, it's on the first page in the letter, but this is what I heard in my head. Um, one of the basic points in recent statements is that our acts are untimely. Some have asked, why don't you give the new administration time to act? And the only answer I can give to this inquiry is that the new administration must be prodded about as much as the outgoing one before acts. It will, it will be, we will be sadly mistaken if we feel that the election of Mr. Biden, in this case, will bring the millennium to the United States as opposed to Alabama. While Mr. Biden is much more articulate and gentle than Mr. Trump, they are both segregationists dedicated to the task of maintaining the status quo. I hope I see in Mr. Biden that he is, he will be reasonable enough to see the futility of massive resistance to racism, racial capitalism and carceral violence, which is what I added. But he will not see this without pressure from those determined to seek radical change to our structures and institutions, this is me getting fancy here, and dedicated to social and racial justice, equity and liberation. I mean, if anything, I think that's like, perhaps like if I can have any biggest calls to action for people to do after this, it's that. Like, don't just get complacent because Joe Biden got elected. We have to continue to push just as hard as we was pushing back in July, just as hard as we was pushing back in October, just as hard as we was pushing in, you know, or Atlanta was pushing in December and January. We got to still push forward. We can't just lay back and think that this is, you know, now it's going to be okay because white dude got elected to office. I totally agree. I think we have a ton of work to do. And um, the last four years um, just multiplied that work twofold, threefold. I don't know how many fold, but I, uh, I agree. I really um, hope that there's no complacency um, on the part of this new government. And I'm really hopeful that with the first black vice president, I I think I'm hopeful that they will keep that agenda alive and that she will continue to push for racial justice. So um, let's just keep our fingers crossed. Um, and I also want to say that, um, moving on to our next question, what are the call to action that MLK gives that we have still not addressed or accomplished? I was muted. Yeah, I mean, we really need to talk about like the existential gaslighting around like white narcissism, which I, that's what I've been calling white supremacy, white narcissism lately. Because it feels like it's, it, it's, it's, I think it's self-explanatory, but we really had to talk about the existential gaslighting around white narcissism and as a springboard to how insidious it is and how embedded it is into every thread making up the fabric of our organization. Like there's this, um, on the third page, there's this passage the, um, that says that unjust law is a code that a, my, that a majority inflicts on a minority that is not binding on itself. This is difference made legal. On the other hand, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow, and that is uh, and that is willing to follow itself. And this sameness is made legal. And like, how is that not just what happened on July 6th, that there's these laws that are unjust because, you know, there, there's there's this disparate treatment. And, and I think, and it, and it shows in some of the institutions of our society, and there was this intersection of institutions of our society in that moment that showed the extent to which white narcissism is, is, is alive and well. I mean, they're over there taking selfies with people. And I mean, there's another piece here too, where it says an un, as, a, as an ex, another explanation that an unjust law is a code inflicted upon a minority, which that major, uh, which that minority had no part in enacting or creating, because it did not have the unhampered right to vote. And that made me think about like the crypto vote movement and like, you know, having accessible voting for disabled folks, especially with the pandemic, it makes me think of gerrymandering and voter suppression. And I think even to a, a you know, a more local uh, example, it makes me even think about, you know, in, in my work, the extreme lack 
of, of Black, Indigenous people of color, and disabled folks in positions of executive leadership are higher, let alone disabled Black and brown folks. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I really hope that we can talk about because you know what's so frustrating about these conversations is that we're having these same conversations like 56, 57 years ago from this letter. And we're, we're in a space where I think that, you know, if we can acknowledge that this is, that this is a problem to the point where we're going to talk about it, then we also have to acknowledge that, you know, and both of them, both ableism and racism, we can acknowledge that these are issues to the point that we are talking about it. Then we also have to acknowledge that people who are experiencing both are experiencing issues that are not only nuanced, but also have been woefully unaddressed. You know, so it's one of those things when I have clients and they're like, you know, I'll bring up things like, okay, we're gonna talk about disability and we're gonna talk about, you know, um, you know, trans inclusion in the workplace where we talk about these things. We're like, oh, no, 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 we hired you for anti-racism work. I'm like, oh, no, no, no to you. You're not gonna be able to do anti-racism work if it's not intersectional. Now, if you ask me to come up and talk about how I can help with your anti-racism initiative, I'm not just gonna leave everything but my, uh, my blackness at the door. I can't leave my disability at the door. I need my cane to walk. I can't leave that at the door. So that is going to have to come in with me. And that means that if you're really going to help to help me be free, if none of us are free, then all of us are free, and I'm going to be free, then you have to bring in disability justice into anti-racism work. Yeah, let, let's focus on that ableism piece. Um, because the, um, the white supremacy, white narcissism um, feeds into this whole ableism, which is um, something that I experience um, almost daily from people. Um, and uh, for example, people know what's best for me. Like you can sit here, you'll be able to see the speaker if you sit here. And I can't imagine, um, I'm trying to imagine what that's like um, when you bring in intersectionality into that equation if there's a person of color with a hearing loss, um, you know, what kind of um, ableist views there are, this probably magnified even more. And so when you think about um, what, what one can do intentionally, and I'm, I'm gonna speak from the perspective of arts and culture, I'm shifting to, to that because uh, I have my public health hat on, you know, I have a public health background, so, I'm always thinking about health and equity and accessibility in the arts and civic life is very much a part of um, how we can start to dismantle um, this racism that we see because anybody who is a person of color, especially one with a disability who walks into a space, is not going to feel welcome because of the structures that exist. And so I'll give you an example. Um, I know there's, there's people who have um, sensitivities to fragrances and there's people who have PTSD, invisible disabilities. Those are really insidious in terms of um, how people will welcome those with invisible disabilities into a space. So someone may have a, a clarity attack and there's a long line that you have to wait um, to get tickets. So what are they supposed to do? They need a place to sit down. They need a place that um, they can go to calm down. They need a place where they can, um, you know, get some fresh air. But spaces are, are not, they're not um, developed with universal design, inclusive design in mind. And so I think that the people who work in these institutions need to take a serious look at how they treat and welcome people of all abilities and all uh, nationalities and ethnicities. And I think that's a place to start is looking at your policies and your practices and your place of business, whether it's you know, um, a coffee shop, a theater or, or whatnot, Anywhere you need to look at how, when you open that door, how are you treating the people who work in there and not having these ableist or um, white privileged 
kind of um, view in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it is hard because it makes me think about, you know, there's something that um, I think uh, Leah Lakshmi of Pia Pensa, Summer Rastinha, I think is how you say it. Um, they have a whole they they have a whole like guidebook that they talk about in um, like the intersection of blackness and disability with sensory uh, 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 sense sensitivity because like I have to you know have my my natural hair care products and natural hair care products are usually scented um, even if they're natural like shea butter has a scent coconut oil has a scent. Um, and there's some folks where it's chemical sensitivity, but there's some folks it's just sense sensitivity. And so there's a difficulty because people will say no sense, but then, you know, I can't do that. I can't, you know, um, and, you know, just the way that my hair is, and even down to the medical piece, you know, I'll, I have a neurologist and, and me and the neurologist have to have a conversation every single time he wants me to do the, um, I think it's the EEG where they put the, the probes on your head. And he's always like, oh yeah, and you have to make sure you wash your hair and make it squeaky clean before you come in. I'm like, I'm about to tell you right now that ain't gonna happen because my hair will fall out by the end of the day. And it's like, it's just these things that I don't think that people are thinking about. Um, and I've, you know, I've gotten in trouble for sticking up for myself when those things have happened. And, you know, people are always telling me, oh, Christiana, you're so pessimistic, or you're too, you know, why are you always pushing all the time and all these different sorts of things. But there's, um, you know, there's these two passages where MLK is saying that it's important to be an extremist uh, for good as a way to redirect the anger and the grief of oppression um, into change work instead of what he says are, quote, ominous expressions of violence. And the reason why I like this is because both, um, I feel like there's this need for, like there's a, there's this need for transformative radical change. And when you, if, if you ask me as a consultant, I tell this to my clients all the time, that is the only way, like if you're like, well, how can my, anti, my organization be anti-racist? How can my, our organization be, dis, you know, have disability justice principles? How can our organization be equitable? You need radical, transformative change. Things that if it's part of the status quo or the systems that exist, it probably ain't gonna work. Because we can create policies and structures and have training and all of that. But if you don't take the time and energy and risk, and when I mean risk, I mean the willingness to take and release like your ill-gotten products of privilege, like power and control. So when, if you don't take the time and energy and risk to make radical transformable change, then they, it's not gonna be successful. Like. I can write the most equi amazingly equitable organizational policy and put them in the most accessible format. And if they don't do any of the work to disrupt and dismantle their conditioned and socialized beliefs, then when they interpret and implement the policies, all of that will be going through, like all of that, all of the, all of the policy that is wrote will be going through the same beliefs and biases and assumptions and expectations that you had when you reached out for help in the first place. So one of the, one of my favorite quote, uh, uh, quotes is that uh, sunlight is the best disinfectant. So like I always tell people like to take the time to shine a light into your shadow places and examine what's going on inside of you and then do it all the time. And then the other reason really quick plainly is because then okay pretty much explained that the rage and the grief is not only okay and natural and collective and justified, but it, that is also a direct result of this society's apathy and resistance to taking the time and energy and risk to ensure my survival and the survival of, of our communities. Like instead they witness the violence and genocide and then they quote Robin DiAngelo and write a BLM statement while I'm drowning. And that's not gonna lead to equity work. Yeah, um, you know, as um, John Lewis said, make good trouble. I mean, I think we have to be okay with um, stepping on people's toes because, I mean, gently, um, you know, I'm of the opinion that, you know, being aggressive and adamant and um, demanding, I don't think gets you anywhere. I feel like you have to build relationships and you have to be curious and empathetic and ask questions and make yourself uncomfortable. and force yourself to ask those questions um, because you have to start stepping on people's toes and say, you know what, 
your attitude is not really appropriate here. And this is how it needs to change and give people concrete examples of that. Um, and um, we all have our blind spots, right? I've been thinking a lot about blind spots. And I know I certainly have quite a few. And I think um, the BIPOC with disabilities was definitely my blind spot. And so, um, so anything that I can do as a white ally to dismantle those prejudices against um, folks of color is, is what I can do. And by talking about it, by getting to know people like you, by asking those questions and making good trouble is all I have um, the ability to do right now. Um, so I think we talked earlier about being direct, right? We had a conversation about the importance of being direct. And sometimes uh, I think you and I are both from the East Coast. I grew up in Buffalo, New York. And I think you grew up in Philadelphia, New Jersey area. Um, and um, so we're both East Coast transplantees. And it's a very different way of communicating um, in the East Coast. People are just out there, you know. But here um, on the West Coast, especially in Seattle, people are really nice and polite. And I think that um, it's hard to be direct sometimes. And so I learned the hard way that um, I need to really um, you know, consider my words carefully and do it in a way that um, is gentle and builds relationships and then people can get to know me and know that I'm not going to bite their head off if, um, if they're not making something accessible. I'm happy to sit down and show them how to do it. But for God's sake, if you're committed to accessibility, do it. Please don't do it piecemeal. Start integrating it into every and to the whole fabric and the structure of your organization, of your strategic plan, of your audience um, outreach, um, everything. It needs to be a philosophy. Um, the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility needs to be integrated um, along with inclusive design and anything that we're developing and talking about. I really believe that. This might be an unpopular opinion among my colleagues in the diversity, equity, and inclusion consulting field. But diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think, is an, in itself is a thing. And in whatever that thing is, it doesn't necessarily have to include disability justice or anti-racism. I think I, you know, I talk about, you know, in a lot of ways, like DEI, because that's what people hear, and it kind of rolls off the tongue, DEI, you know, talking about, you know, transformative and radical systems change to the very fabric of our society is a lot longer of a term. But I think that it is kind of a space where I've been thinking, well, what exactly do we, call? I'd say social equity. I guess, like, how do we, how do we reach parity in our society? But I think it's always a hard thing to talk about, but I think it is it is it is right to, you know, that it's important for us to move towards a space where we are I it, we just, you know, to create that tension we we're saying in the same paragraph. Um Martin Luther King says, we need to see uh we must see the need of having nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help people to rise from the death, the dark death of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and unity. And so it's it's important to do that. And I think too, interestingly, he tells, he says, you know, when you're saying, well, you know, what does that look like? He says um, how to do that um, somewhere near the end where he was, he was lamenting, well, I had hoped that the white moderate would see this, maybe I'm too optimistic, but he said, but there are uh, some people, he said, um, there are some they, that he is thankful, however, for some of the, our, um, the white folks in solidarity who have grasped the meaning of the social revolution and committed themselves to it. They, unlike many of their uh, moderate uh, cohorts, 
have recognized the urgency of the moment and sensed the need for powerful action, action in quotes, anecdotes, to combat the disease of segregation, or in our case, still segregation. We're talking about anti-racism and ableism and intersections and just pretty much social inequity in general. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think that um, King's piece, his letter um, from the jail, had so many amazing um, words of wisdom in there that I think we can really apply right now in this day and age. And um, I think that seeking um, solidarity with our um, colleagues, um, whether they're in the DEI space. And I think it's all semantics. I think we all um, believe that we need to move forward and um, understand one another better. And Christiana, you have the most amazing language around this that I didn't experience growing up um, because I'm white and you, know, you are a person of color, right? You're black. And you know you have been around this. You live it and you breathe it. Whereas I, I live and I breathe disability. Um, and so you're giving me the ability to start thinking about it in a different way. So I really thank you for that. I really value um, our collaboration over the last year and a half. It's been um, tremendous for me. I hope you know that. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, and I appreciate it. I think like the biggest thing I can say with disability justice, and especially within our disability community, in terms of intersectionality, is to remember that like we're both disabled, so we're both experiencing ableism, um, and so to that. Um, that is not a, a um, something that is not unique to me. Um, it's just that on top of experiencing ableism, I am also experiencing racism and I'm also experiencing this interesting compounding impact of the two of them together. And that's just those two. That's not all the other pieces of my intersectionality that I have to navigate every day. Those are just the two that we listed on the title of this workshop. Um, and so just in that, it just in those two, I have, you know, these this experience of racism and this experience of racialized ableism, in addition to the shared experience of ableism. And so I think this is also where why intersectionality and cross movement solid uh, cross disability solidarity is so important from disability justice's principles, because we have to if we're going to recognize wholeness, another principle of the people who are in our community, we also have to recognize that that means that there are people who have um, intersecting, uh, 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 intersecting areas of oppression um, that's sort of coming together in this sort of uh, cluster ball of, of terribleness. And I think the, the other <laughs> great thing to take away too that I'll say is um, the importance of the principles of interdependence and collective liberation. You know, we should not have to, we should not need to seasonally broadcast black and brown bodies being brutalized on every screen in the world in order for folks to momentarily uh, hold our humanity while also getting their fill of tongue wagging at our expense and our elders and our ancestors and our progeny's expense. This would be something that, you know, it, it's right in front of our face. And so at this point, you know, I, if, if, if there continues to be tension and hesitation in your body about whether this is an issue and whether it applies to you, I would lean into that. I will lean yeah. into that. And I would make sure I, I would just lean into that. I'm not saying any, you know, anything will come of it, but I'm just saying take the time to make sure that you are staying in a space of self-awareness. And I guess the last thing I'll say too is just think about how we can continue to push forward the calls to action to abolish the police and transfer for those resources in the communities and directly into the pockets of those of us who have been socioeconomically oppressed and intergenerationally impoverished and strengthen and uplift community mutual aid and work towards an anti-capitalist society where our basic needs are supported and we don't have to 
fight in, you know, be in survival over our basic needs. Like, let's do some real parity work here. I mean, if we, if, 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 if the momentum in the Congress and the fact that we have the congressional votes are to not be of any consequence at all, let's actually, let's actually, do, let's actually do this and get this done. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I, I love your point about leaning into it, lean into it, and also realizing that there's so much diversity within disability. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times people sang to me and um, they think that I know sign language, um, but I don't. Um, and so there's so much um, diversity within. And so examining your assumptions about what, you, what you've learned from the media and leaning into that, oh, whoops, you know, I need to learn more about this. So thank you so much for this amazing conversation. I'm looking forward to answering some questions. Yeah. So um, it's it's time to switch over to Q and A, um, and um, the first question that we have is, why do we always talk about administration and government? Why not discuss what we can do as individuals, intentionally or unintentionally? We also behave differently with people like disabled people. I can say this is a conversation I have a lot. And the reason why we are talking about government and administration is that we are talking about individuals because government administration is made up of individuals. And all the way back to Greek, to the Greek history, to the Socrates, to the Aristotle, to the Plato, we talk about how to be in society with each other is an active process. It's, it, we can't be on autopilot if we are to make it work in an equitable way. And this is a conversation that isn't new and it isn't, it isn't even 60 years old. It's, it's, it's not even 600 years old. It's it, the, the, the concept of society being an active process has lasted for a while. And so as I was saying earlier, all of those products, those institutions and those systems and those policies and those laws, we need to talk about them but we need to talk about them from the lens of realizing that all of them are products of people and not just people who are in them, but the people who are voting for them, the people who are passing initiatives, the people who are, who are implementing them, upholding them, fighting them. So I think that it's, it's important to hold it a both and. It's not saying either or, it's saying both and. And the both and I think is gonna be really, really important. Okay. Um, the next question um, is, may I ask from your perspective, is there a role big tech needs to have in terms of technology to assist in addressing such intersections, other than what they are already doing, of course? Um, you're looking at me like I need to answer this one, but yeah, I definitely think that um, <laughs> big tech needs to have a, a larger role in um, this conversation. Um, you know, we live in one of the wealthiest areas in the United States, and it's because of big tech. And so um, the money is going, could be going to um, better initiatives um, that we could be working on, like you know, initiatives dealing with um, housing or initiatives dealing with access, you know, all of the above. And I think that big tech also needs to be thinking about um, the products that they design and who they're designing them for. So again, it's ableist philosophy. They want to make money, which, you know, everyone wants to make money, but if you expand your audience, just think of how much more money you could make if you think about people with disabilities um, and how they could be using your products. So definitely big tech could you play a, big, a bigger role in thinking about those things. Okay. Um, how do you address competing intersections? So this person is asking about a supervisor uh, who is male and 90% fluent in English. The employee is a mixed ethnicity female. 
uh, with numerous invisible disabilities, including a learning disability that the supervisor is aware of. However, when accommodations are requested for that learning disability, the HR director sides with the supervisor, implying that his cultural norms take precedence. This creates an uncomfortable situation where culture and race are pitted against ability. How would you address approaching this situation to encourage more equity? You know, I think that the difficulty in the situation is that it seems like the um, people who are making decisions or inhibiting the equity work from happening is focusing on the wrong thing. In racial equity spaces, there is a phrase that is a not all skin folk or kin folk. And I have seen that in some spaces um, that there is sort of, you know, this tendency of, you know, to um, not to, to, to not challenge whether, you know, when there is this, these sort of tangles coming on. And there is, you know, there is actually something in a letter about it, which I, I wish that I had it here. But, you know, Martin Luther King talked about how there was some folks who really did believe that, um, oh, here it is. They talk, he, talk, he talks about how there's different sort of people uh, you know, that he's having to have attention with within the black community even back then. And he said, one is uh, made up of black folks who as a result of years long oppression have been so completely drained of self-respect and a sense of quote, somebodiness that they have adjusted to segregation. And on the other hand, um, this, is, this is what I talk about, a, a few black folks in the middle class who because of a degree of academic and economic security and because it points um, they profit uh, by segregation. They have unconsciously become unsensitive to the problem of the masses. Um, and I think it's that latter one that I think it's really important for us within uh, BIPOC communities to hold our people accountable because this is a thing. Um, it is a thing. And, you know, I uh, know I'm not alone in having um, elders and um, community members and people who will say something and, you know, you just, I think that um, I would definitely say it's something that is a sort of internal community work to be done. Um, but I would say in this case that um, I would agree that inequity was done and you know it would perhaps be a longer answer than even this long-winded one to tell you exactly how to address it. But um, I guess the shortest answer is that I would continue to find advocacy. Um, someone perhaps who is at the intersections of both um, the uh, person who's doing harm and the person harmed. I'm like a disabled uh, person uh, who's South Asian or Middle Eastern and have them perhaps come in to mediate where they can stand in the uh, experiences of both people and uh, help to make um, a fair and equitable decision. Okay. Um, please explain what is meant by white narcissism as opposed to the idea that we all live in a white supremacy culture and are swimming in the same ocean or living in the same house that was built way before we were born. The foundation is deep and well built. We maintain it, but also the awareness on a great scale is not there. The paradigm that racism and ableism are deeply rooted in our country is complex and building awareness is the first step, not pathologizing the behavior of individual members of the dominant culture. I mean, the world isn't even built for left-handedness yet. We need to build allies, not enemies. I appreciate your, um, what you're sharing. I think in, in using the word uh, narcissism, I think I'm talking about this perhaps, you know, more from a sociological perspective. And I mean, this is what, this is what I would offer to you. 
if we're going to, you know, first of all, I would, I would, I would wonder to what extent we would want to continue to to connect um, the what is happening and the dynamic of what is happening to anything um, relating to the word supremacy or what what is supreme about it. And is it that white folks see themselves as supreme, or is it that they insist on seeing themselves centered in everything that they, you know? And when I say that centered in everything, I think we're immediately going to think of something explicit, like someone who's going to be, you know, perhaps come into space and want to take up space literally but i'm not saying that i'm talking about look at our textbooks who has written our history who is in office who is in leadership what happens when a black person is in leadership did you see what happened when obama was elected the fact that whiteness was decentered at the highest level of office has literally been one of the foundational precursors to what happened on january 6 because there is this tendency to want to center whiteness. There is a Eurocentrism, and in that Eurocentrism is a existential narcissism that leads to gaslight and harm people who are not representative of this litmus, this archetype of perfection and what is good and right in the status quo that we have been trying to dismantle. I mean, we're talking about in the last 60 years, but the folks who have been harmed and enslaved and killed by it has been trying to fight for this for the last 600 years plus. So, I mean, I, I hear you because I, I do want to be mindful of not using ableist language. I just don't know. I don't want to call it white supremacy because I don't want to give any indication that there's anything supreme about it. And it does feel like narcissism. But I will, I will continue to think about it in if I can find a different term than narcissism to explain that dynamic I just shared with you, then um, I will definitely try to adopt that instead. That was a great answer. I, um, there's a word that I've heard often, it's called egocentric. Um, and I know that um, Americans uh, have the reputation of being egocentric. For, you know, how do I hear what disabled people need in my community if, if I don't know many personally? That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I think um, that's true of many people if they have not had contact with a person with a disability, but um, remember those invisible disabilities as well. So um, running for Americans has a disability so they may not um, be forthright about that. Um, there's lots of things you can do to learn more about um, what people with disabilities need. You can um, certainly read books um, by and for people with disabilities. You can volunteer and learn more about what people with disabilities need. Um, and you can um, talk to people and find out who is connected to other people with disabilities, because um, at some point um, you'll find that one of your connections knows someone. I would give you a, cha give you a challenge to, um, to research who are the Black disabled or Black Indigenous people of color who are disabled, who are thought leaders in this field. You know, people like, um, we probably could start right, right uh, names off like Tinu and um, uh, Lydia X Z Brown and uh, uh, Mia Mingus and Leah Lakshimi, Pim Penza, Samarin Hinta. Yeah, follow them. Alyssa Thompson, follow them. Follow them and just listen. Because the thing is, they'll talk about what that experience is, but they're also going to talk about it in terms of what's happening right now. And I'll also give you a heads up that uh, Twitter is where a lot of disabled folks are at. So Christiana, um, those didn't come out well on the um, closed captioning. And I'm wondering Ooh. if you could put those names in the chat, um, you would need to change the chat to panelists and attendees, or you could provide them to me and I can put them in the follow-up letter that people will receive tomorrow. If, it, if you want, and if it would help, I have, a like resource list exactly for this with those names and links to their Twitter. If you want me to put that in the chat, I can. Sure. So you need to change the chat to panelists and attendees.
Okay, great. Um, so somebody asks, I love the idea of creative tension and its importance to progress but I've also seen how damaging polarization and partisanship in the US have been. How do we distinguish between tensions that drive progress forward and those that aggravate damaging divides? Are the two linked? And if so, how do we make sure to create tension that is productive? He actually talks about this, I just didn't say it. So um, I think it's over here. Okay, I have it. We have all these notes. So I probably see how you're seeing how I am. Okay, here it is. So he was saying, um, when he was talking about being considered an extremist in, you know, in this, in this tendon, you know, in this, in this call for having tension. And he said, um, as, but as you know, I, I gradually gained a bit of satisfaction from being considered an extremist. And he talks about was not, you know, Jesus an extremist. And he says, love your enemies and bless them that curse you. He talked about was, was not Amos an extremist and like, let, let, just, let justice uh, roll down like water and righteousness. So he says after like, he has like this list of people that he like quotes, these quotes of them talking about, you know, all these people who are seen as these, um, as these peaceful people having these quotes about creating tension. And at the end, he says, um, so the question is not whether it will be extremist, but what kind of extremist will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of justice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? And he had said something um, earlier too about um, you know, as long as your means are as pure as your desired ends, then the tension in itself is, is for the right cause. And so I would say, I'm just going to use what MLK said as my answer. Because <laughs> I think that, you know, it, it's hard to, but I think a lot of that too is going to be doing you know, you have to be in touch with yourself and, and do that introspection work I was talking about earlier so that you can be in touch with yourself about whether or not the tension you're creating um, is you being an extremist for good and justice or if it's an extremist for something else. We, we have more questions and we're gonna be able to take. Um, so I'm going to give you one last one before we switch over to um, conclusion. Um, what should we do if we have temporary disabilities and our supervisors are unwilling to provide much accommodation? In a lot of universities, the debility, disability resources for students only accepts applications for disability accommodations once per quarter, and only so much can happen after that deadline. What could we do to advocate for more flexibility for people with disabilities in higher education? <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. There's a lot of work that needs to be done in higher education and in education period, um, in all the systems and institutions, but especially education. And um, I would say the number one thing that would help with um, which is a which is a huge goal. I'm going to say it, but the huge goal is I think we have to rethink how we um, how we transfer knowledge in our situ in our society. And, you know, and I think that that is a big ask and a big question. But I think that that's really the root of it. Is is are we even using the structure that is needed? That is the most accessible. That is the most equitable structure. For, uh, for knowledge sharing and transfer of knowledge. And I, I'm not of a fan of it, but um, one of the books in there, and I will put it in the chat after I'm done yapping is Discrit, um, which is a book that talks about um, the, at the intersection of critical race theory and disability justice, how those intersect and impact in the K through 12 environment and impact the school to prison and school to institutionalization pipeline. And I would really suggest that um, if that is something that you're interested in. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if you can put it in the chat now, that would be great. 
Um, it's time for us to wrap up and I want to thank our panelists for a wonderful discussion. Um, the, um, I'm going to um, put up um, the link to um, our evaluation for this workshop. And I've also put it in the chat. I'll put it in the chat one more time. Um, your filling out these evaluations is enormously helpful to us in planning future workshops. So we, we really would appreciate your doing that. Um, so I'm gonna pop it in one more time. And uh, Christiana, did you get your link in there? Yes, okay, great. Um, so thank you so much everybody for attending. Um, you will get a letter from us um, in about 24 hours, which will remind you about filling out the evaluation if you haven't already. Um, if you have any questions, um, also please feel free to email me. Um, and my email will be in that letter. Um, and then I can forward your questions on to our presenters. Thank you so much. This concludes our presentation.